Okay, um, so guys, uh, I guess this is part two. I realize I actually have my other laptop. So this one has, what is it? It's 37% battery. And uh, I was just talking without like realizing the stream had just disconnected. So this is part two, and I'm gonna, I guess, extend this a bit longer. People didn't hear me say it, but I was I was saying exactly he knows exactly the location of the cave because he's seen it with the eyes of his heart with his universal self. And so <clears throat> uh, he tells his disciple, you got to go exactly to this cave and you got to save this guy before the slave masters come and take him back. Right. But there's only one condition. <clears throat> You're not allowed to say a single word to this guy. This disciple feels like a hero, feels it's such an important moment, and the guy's been a warrior back in the day before, you know, he feels a strength, he feels a being proud of the moment. He quickly gets on his horse and goes exactly to the place where Hafez was saying the cave was. And he goes really fast, he gets there before the slave masters are there, <clears throat> and he sees that the guy is at the center of the cave just praying, scared. But when he goes there, he gets happy. He's like, nice, the slave masters aren't here. I'm going to save this guy. He suddenly realizes, Hafez told him that the divine said this guy cannot say a single word. There is no time. He has to quickly take this guy out of that place before the slave masters arrive. So he, in some sense, ties the guy's hand. And this guy, the slave's hands are tied to this rope, to this horse where Hafez is moving. Right? <clears throat> and so what happens, right, is that suddenly it's such a bizarre moment because the slave is shouting crying saying god i don't want to go back to this hell why why are you doing this and the whole time this is happening the disciple as if his soul is weeping tears grown man on a horse with a sword at his belt but guys this world is more than an ideological game and what our emotions are, like what are emotions, what are their... I don't know, for me it was a moment where I just felt it doesn't make sense in such a collective system, in a, in a reality where there's an interconnectedness, where things are emerging as networks of causal and let's say factual relationships. And you know what it is? <clears throat> it's feelings are here so that if we are not, if we don't know, if like, you know what it is? It's kind of like you objectively imagine you were like, um, imagine there was an, okay, let's say what is the human intelligence doing? It, it objectively analyzes, comes to a conclusion, and then it subjectively analyzes, comes to a conclusion, links the objective and subjective conclusion. Then the linked objective sub subjective conclusion is reanalyzed with the whole moment. And when there's a consideration of space, then the person's like, oh yeah, we are actually ex having a non-physical experience of a physical reality because we're aware of the space. So the biggest proof is the awareness, the biggest proof of the soul is the awareness of space. the biggest proof that you're not just a material entity. I mean, obviously, people have dreams 
and in the dream the body your body's sleeping in your bed but your brain is creating a body for you and you get to experience sensation and then you wake up and you remember that dream what does that mean that means consciousness is recording information from a real and an abstract universe at the same time but the body's only in a physical universe I don't know if people are understanding what I'm saying. Your intelligence is not just a, a responding to physicality. It's also res responding to non-physical events. So if you're an intelligence that is being influenced by a non-physical event, how can you just be a not physical being? So what is going on is that the argue, philosophical argument is coming back where is reality imagined or is imagination real? Are we imagining reality, which means is non-fiction accepting, uh, excuse me, is fiction accepting non-fiction or is non-fiction creating fiction? You see, it's about the nature of our world. There's mysteries here. Let's say right now we knew everything about the human being. Sure, we still don't know everything about the world. So our knowledge is destined to be incomplete till the end of time because the world is too big to index to have an accurate resolution. So everything is language games. So you, your heart unseals when you kind of like, this is my, Mr. Within's opinion, that you pause for a moment and try to feel what you are without just thinking you're just an object and subject. Try to feel how you feel as that which is noticing how your body is being present in this like spherical awareness of your mind like the consciousness is like the candle frame uh, the wick of the candle is like the brain and the glow of the candle uh, the glow of the candle is consciousness the candle flame and the wick is like the brain and the mind and so what it is is we are in the presence of our own glowing life force do you know we are in the presence of our own divine experience of our existence? You know, let's say in the future we have a sacred sacred meter. <laughs> you know, imagine people go to like a temple and they, you know, touch a part of this uh, sacred meter, you know, to <laughs> the sacred meter to like the floor of the temple and the sacred meter says this is a very pure temple. You know, its sacredness is probably like above like 14.0. <laughs> you know, like some abstract measurement system, you know. I have seen people who I know that they, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, there was a time where two years I had to go to like, I have smoked a ridiculous amount of cigarettes, you know, in Dundas Square, staring at what society looks like every day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And... <clears throat> you got to take yourself to a moment where you were simple enough to be acceptable to yourself. You see, we don't know what is best. We're pretty much, everybody's like shooting in the dark, right? This is why the concept of hope exists. And some people hate the idea of hope because they're like, I can't, how long should I imagine? You know? For me, I'm like, okay, what do we have? We need to have a sort of managerial, managerial attitude to the human species. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying like I'm someone who's like, you know, worthy to again individual happening my personality is in some sense how my body being on earth is leading to a unique kind of you know um, you know light in in a hall of mirror kind of setting of consciousness because what it is is levels of activation just like somebody who's driven a vehicle before you activate the vehicle and you have a consciousness of the whole vehicle if you're someone like I'm someone who in this lifetime I've driven so much you don't know how many hours I've just driven, you know, and there's many people, of course, right? But in, in, in these hours of driving, it's like the first couple of years you're, you're trying to like, you know, you have structure and focus. And after years, everything becomes second nature. Um, I need to give... Um, messed up, right? And now we have to... The whole species has to deal with everything. Right? That's the cool thing about realizing you're a member of a species. It's like being a member of... 
people are going to be like, what do you mean, Mr. Within Creature is it, sponsored? That means that if the, it, right now, me as a creature in a world, having a, this ability to speak to you is not just from me. It's my presence. My presence is me being the space before I am what's in the space. So the space is free from what's in it. Your mind already knows it's beyond your body. It's just that the body doesn't know how it can trust the mind. Fast forwarding film and then a part of your intelligence is trying to see the film frame by frame. <clears throat> you know, it's all about speed and certainty because what is knowledge? Dear viewers, whoever you are, this is going to be probably the question I want viewers to ask uh, answer in the comment section. Right? I've had this vision that the comment section of all these Mr. Within lectures are going to have so many incredible academic comments that even universities might use the comment sections. So I would encourage people's honest, direct experience of life being shared in the comment section. Two thousand twenty-three is an incredible year. It's a year where a species realizes its potential. Imagine this happening to someone who, like, I think at the time, <clears throat> at the time I'd given maybe like a you know a thousand talks or something about like the advancement of reality and all this, right? And, and when I heard this, to me there was something very, I don't know how to say it. There was something very bizarre, because I wondered what do we hate. Like even when it comes to love and hate, right? Let's say right now I'm looking at this tree in front of me and I say to myself, I hate this tree, right? And sure, like somebody could be in front of me and be like, yo, this guy really hates that tree. <laughs> Do you know? But what am I hating, really? Does my hatred affect the tree? If I don't act, nothing's happened. The hatred is affecting me. Do you understand? It's as if like racism is a self-inflicting disease. Do you know? All the isms. Because ultimately we have to be like, okay, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of human beings living on a rock. They have to live efficient. Who you are. I don't know what you are. What kind of being you are. I don't know how many beings are even within you when you're listening to this. You could be a person who there could be probably like a hundred beings looking through your consciousness or you could be a person with only you've realized such selflessness that no being can look through your consciousness like there's no nothing to look through do you know <clears throat> but really the thing is we have to make a choice life is like this temporary journey of a physical format and we're like okay we're, we're here once now how do we want to live do we want to live like the past do we want to live like people around us in the present or do we want to live in a way where we realize that we are a human being and we have a DNA that nothing in the world has yet. In the future there may be cloning, in the future there may be advanced androids that could replicate genetics, right? But <clears throat> at the same, that could be, you know, similar. But right now we're at a point where our inner realms are not too interfered with. And if, the, if you're living unconsciously, which means you're not aware of living your life, something else is living your life through you. But when something else lives through you, because when the person is having fun, their attention is less uh, influenced by its limitation. It's as if it doesn't care for its limitation, so it experiences a limitless moment. And reality is not about everybody like showing off like, yo, bro, I'm an enlightened being, you know, you're an enlightened being. It's like, I don't think you're as enlightened as me, bro. You know, <laughs> you know it's like we don't need that enough, enough subjective games. We just need a species to become street smart, realize that there's the, the biggest problem to solve are the dangers of inner extinction and outer extinction and also the motive of immortal purpose. If somebody says, Mr. Within, do you see an immortal purpose to humanity? I would say, yeah, I've managed to envision it. Envision it. 
I've, I've managed to, like, this is the cool thing about being a human being, that you can use the geometry in the present and look at the ge how the geometry of the past got to the present to, in some sense, probabilize how the geometry of the future will arrive. Like, people don't know this, but I could look at anything in the present and maybe in a period of, like, 10 minutes or so, even less, come up with a future, what that phenomenon would look like in the future. It's like one of those skills I've mastered. Why? Because what really knowledge is, is the placement of shape in space. And when you go to actually learn knowledge, there's different mo modes of it, right? There is a type of knowledge where you have to be taught. There is a type of knowledge which is remembered. And then there is a type of knowledge that doesn't come from you. Okay? So what does that mean? Imagine there was this kid who had graduated from high school and the day after he went back to the high school and the principal was like, yo, can you help out like hand pieces of paper like, you know, in one of the classrooms or something for today, like act as a substitute teacher, you know? And that kid who had graduated, he went there and he acted as a substitute teacher and it was as if he had reached a certain level where he had realized there's something to give. People don't understand. Consciousness is here to give something to the world. Why else would it be able to receive? If somebody says, Mr. Within, should I pray? Should I repent? Should I meditate? What should I do if I feel my heart is sealed and I'm, I'm not experiencing uh, the, the divine reality in the present reality? You know, I am waiting. I am waiting to see if in my lifetime <coughs> uh, the songs of the advanced civilization will be heard. And I am waiting to see the emergence of the advanced humanity which in the inner realms has already arrived. Probably years ago. Like even centuries ago. Because, let me tell you this, right now in 2020, I can have... I can envision, probabilize what like a couple thousand years may look like, okay? But back in the day, the animal didn't had not discovered the human intelligence, hadn't discovered a relationship with its own future. The mind hadn't become the future back in the day, so everything was here and now. All those people in the New Age community going into the here and now and being non-dual and thinking that they just have to do nothing and they're being everything, it's like, that's, that's, that's precious, you know? Kind of like Gollum, Lord of the Rings, non-dualistic, precious, you know? <laughs> but really what it is, is you're going to realize for billions of years, we have actually been a non-dual being the, it's like when a person it's like the person thought spirituality was the most important thing and then the person got the spiritual realization they were eternal and they're like that's hilarious so I my spiritual experience was that I realized I've always been here and the human experience is new Right? We have this view we're temporary beings in an eternal world we don't have this view we're eternal beings in a temporary world so the temporary world is the privilege, it's the opportunity, you know? And you know, I have a vision, sometimes I've had a vision of my, in quotations, higher self. And you know what it is? It's like our souls are so advanced that they don't need to be visible, they don't need to be a shape. So it's like something that has matured to a shapeless level has incredible ability using lesser dimensional shape. But a higher dimensional being would imply, like here's the thing, imagine somebody, let's say a shaman, right, has contact with the spirit of nature, takes ayahuasca, and they say that when you contact, like when you take ayahuasca, you are contacted by mother ayahuasca, this sort of goddess presence in nature. Do you know? 
<clears throat> and so imagine somebody communicating with like a, a sort of uh, like goddess archetype or in some sense you know it, it's like there's some people who egotistically want the interdimensional to interact with them and there's some people who just by the frequency just by them abiding by their true nature all their work in the lifetime actually gets done you see, it's the reliance on force. What force are you relying on? Are you trying, are, do you create intermediaries or do you rely on your own force? Or at some point, like what are we left with? We're left with being a moment. Like they don't teach us how to be, they teach us what to do. They tell us what to do, but they don't teach us how to be as we do it. You know, that's something that the person cultivates. <clears throat> So anyways, um, last comment before I end this off, you know, who knows, maybe like a Rubik's Cube, you know, over time, you know, as we care for what is uh, important, which is life, right? That means I would, if, you know, if humanity would be restructured, it might be even completely restructured, been having Silicon Valley focus on trying to find uh, a means of human beings eating food without killing animals. You know what the difference is back in the day <clears throat> the hunter was honest he would grab a spear and like slap, slap you know throw it at the buffalo now we go to the grocery store and we just get an organized product we don't have a connection to the life that was within that product right and this is difficult because the whole society's condition it's like we're, we're kind of like seal your heart find a moment where you can press pause on you know the story of life your ego and just for a moment try to feel try to feel like if if the world is alive do you know like do you know what i'm saying it might not be a human life same but it's it's like it's alive you know there's a presence here right and once you honor this presence you honor it by realizing the idea of you. You know what it is? It's like the ego acts like God and the human being feels unfulfilled. And then the ego stops acting like God. And then the whole world has a chance to reanimate. Because if we are to think, what is the spiritual, excuse me, what is the spiritual experience of a religious person? The answer is, is divine union or in certain cultures they would call it vahdat right or ahad or in arabic which it means oneness you know oneness of being <clears throat> imagine we all came from oneness you know it's like energy it's like the petals of a flower it all came from the seed the design of nature is there. Nature is like doing its thing regardless of if we think about it or not. But if we think about it, we can interact. And it's kind of like an interdimensional attributeless witness being in symbiosis with a, a shape, with a dimension of form. You know, like it's very difficult to say if we're in a world of form or, you know, form or if we're space and form is interacting with us. So anyways... I would say the idea is not it's not even a religious thing you can say it's just this notion that sometimes when you try to be certain about the structure of life you forget that you need to uh, find the humility and realize that it's unknown and it's okay for there to be moments that are unknown when you realize this a great contentment finds you and then the unsealing of the artificial heart means that because you're being an artificial self you're not accessing who you truly are when you're being it so this is why that the faith is not just in the inconceivable dimension beyond the world not an inconceivable dimension beyond others not an inconceivable dimension beyond the self it, it's literally like a presence right so when i say unsealing of the heart it's as if you suddenly feel you by by acknowledging what you were doing wrong at least now you understand 
to become worthy again so really th what the idea of unsealing of the artificial heart refers to is that you're unsealing yourself from what is actually unreal and the bizarre thing is when you look at the ancient yogis reality was unreal to them And now we're just like trying to have joy and suffering in reality. There's so many angles, so many, like the more I'm realizing, the, the, the more we uphold the responsibility of being a mind in our universal sector, the more we realize how many levels of reality are happening at the same time. <clears throat> and as because if truth isn't instantaneous, it's most likely isn't truth, experientially speaking. So anyways, guys, I hope this episode was helpful and, you know, try it out. Maybe for one day, you know, just apologize from the living universe. You know, apologize to the living universe for any inefficiency and for anything that you did not know. And for a moment, be like, okay, I'm a conscious being in a world and dear world, you know, let's do what we're here to do. You know, it's like that. It becomes a sort of thing of... I think those people who can love themselves, they have an unsealed heart. But those people sealed. Objective, subjective, same character is moving in the story, in its own story, is suggesting how the story is simultaneously being the presence of what truth can be. Because if truth is here, it's here. If truth doesn't exist, it was never here. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's one of those things. It's either or. And if you like read code, just thinking things stuff, that's one of the privileges of being aware. And so as 8 billion hearts are unsealed, I think that devotion to the most advanced ideal, right? If you're a secular person, live for the advanced civilization. Uh, if you're a mental narrative or agent and it, from the objective narrative, what's the most advanced things human beings can build? And it's their greatest victory. That means we are becoming beings so advanced that we're living for the greatest victory of the realm, of the moment. And when we look at how now... <laughs> We're walking like his cat. <laughs> walking his cat in the park, you know, with a leash. <laughs> <laughs> and so imagine this extraterrestrial lands Right, and the cat notices, you know, and then the philosopher notices, let's say mystic philosopher, and the extraterrestrial suddenly reveals itself in the inner realms of the philosopher and says, yo, what are you guys doing here? Like, what are you human beings doing here on earth? Like, wh what are you, where are you, right? And we human beings are like, yo, we're honest, we just say we don't know. <laughs> and then the extraterrestrial is like, wow, such humility, do you know? And then we ask the extraterrestrial, and the extraterrestrial is like, buddy, of course, you're in this galaxy, da 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 da. And it will be like, yeah, but you still don't know either, you know? <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> that means I think, like, in the future, you know, humanities, like extraterrestrials, are going to invade humanity, and humanity, human philosophers are going to philosoph philosophically challenge the reasoning behind the invasion, and then extra those extraterrestrials are going to send their philosophers debating our philosophers if their invasion makes sense. <laughs> See, the lower the battery of my laptop is becoming, the sillier I'm becoming, guys. I think there's a correlation. <laughs> Anyways, it's all for the advanced humanity. It's for the greatest performance of the human species before it enters the void. If you have arrived as a conscious uh, crew member on spaceship earth sure enjoy the spaceship but at some point do not forget that you know, the human intelligence has an incredible role of managing commanding and piloting and navigating dimensions of reality and so human ability will surpass what it is now simply because the idea of what human to be human means
beings is going to change. And when human beings realize dehumanized archetypes can be introduced in humanized ways, right? It's as if like some part, the important part of speech or the reason why, the, the, you know, uh, there has been uh, in some sense people speaking like satsangs and whatnot is because the divine, uh, it, it creates a language of humanization through the using the humanization as language. So what it means is when I was younger, I, I you know, I experienced automatic writing and like, you know, automated speech, automated writing. I've, I've experienced these things. Okay. <clears throat> and in the end, what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of like in those states, you have such trust in the rhythm of the moment that the moment automatically happens. Right. And it's really like this. The more you distrust your universe, the more of an ideological, isolated entity you become. The more you trust your reality, the more of a multidimensional, experiential presence you become. And mankind should not fear its presence because there's nothing to fear. It's been here. You know, even though I was born in 1991, all the things that I've been taught, I taught, like, you know, when I talk, it's like the world was happening. We are part of, you know, the greatness of reality. Just like how I'm live streaming this episode where I'm translating my inner realms to the outer realms. Similarly, something is live streaming human consciousness. And death is like when the live stream is over, when the broadcast ends. That means I'm, I'm like that guy in history say, wait a minute, is consciousness being broadcasted? Like, you know, like it's like imagine somebody using a drone, right? Remote control drone camera, right? So, or using a remote control car, right? So it's as if, imagine the car becomes conscious and doesn't know it's being remotely controlled. And so the notion of the soul being beyond the veil of the sensory perception was the implication of an inconceivable controller of the conception. Now this force, I've looked at lesser species like birds and squirrels and I've looked at them and I've kind of been like, okay, how can I, what is the strategy? Like what's going on in the brain of this animal, right? And the animal pauses, like literally becomes a statue, pauses looks around and then sit in the suddenly with a fast rhythm already knowing what to do gets get the whole moment in here and now I'm a creature with limbs moving on a realm in a world landscape do you know and I'm conscious I can notice myself and we have reached such an advanced level of humanity I mean like so far I mean compared to the past it's advanced compared to the future nothing's advanced That's it. Compared to the past, everything's in mass. And it's the nature of the human being. We've pretty much built an, un an unnatural, artificial world in nature, and we're behaving differently to other species. This behavioral differentiation gives us an ability to notice things and access dimensions and create and maintain and destroy things that other creatures cannot even fathom. We are an incredible expression of an unknown world uh, growing to know itself. So anyways, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. <clears throat> when the divine unseals your heart like a Rubik's Cube, it's like a moment where you feel like, yo, do I want to be a human being that has never existed before, a new being? Or do I want to be a being that is just, you know, keeping the past alive in the space where the future needs to arrive. Our greatness is in this simple statement. Rise, mankind, rise. Thank you for listening. Namaste. And share, subscribe, comment, and like, and... What if greatness is the presence of being? What if we are great and how we are present before our personality expects something?